We've all heard the inspiring stories. A child from an underprivileged background overcomes adversity, excels in school, and achieves great things. These narratives paint education as the ultimate equalizer, a place where hard work and talent can triumph over any obstacle. But sociologist Pierre Bourdieu challenges this comforting myth. His work forces us to confront the uncomfortable truth. Schools, far from being neutral spaces of learning, often function in ways that perpetuate social inequality. Subtly, unintentionally perhaps, the system favors the children who were born with the right kind of advantages, those who possess the cultural capital valued within the dominant class. To understand the implications of Bourdieu's critique, let's unpack this idea of cultural capital and the less obvious advantages some students carry with them into the classroom. Think back to a time you've walked into a situation feeling out of your depth. Maybe it was a fancy dinner party where you didn't recognize the cutlery, or a job interview full of jargon you didn't understand. That feeling of not quite knowing the unspoken rules, that's a tiny glimpse into what many children face every day in the classroom. Bourdieu argued that schools reward a specific type of cultural capital. This includes formal knowledge, refined manners, what's considered good taste in art, music, and literature. Things middle and upper class kids absorb effortlessly at home through conversations, weekend trips to museums, and exposure to a variety of cultural experiences. It's like having a secret cheat sheet for an important exam, one that many students never even knew existed. Consider this. A child grows up in a home filled with books where parents read bedtime stories, discuss current events over dinner, and engage in stimulating conversations. Their weekends might involve museum trips, music lessons, or attending plays. Now imagine another child, equally bright, whose home has few books, if any. Their parents work multiple jobs and lack the time or resources for enriching outings. Both children enter school, but are they truly starting from an equal position? The first child already possesses knowledge, vocabulary, habits, and tastes that seamlessly align with what the school system values and rewards. They understand the subtle rules of classroom behavior, like making eye contact when speaking to the teacher or raising their hand before blurting out an answer. They pick up on the literary or artistic references teachers make. Their writing style is what's considered polished because it reflects the conventions they've been exposed to at home. All of this gives them an invisible head start, often mistaken for innate intelligence. Meanwhile, the second child may struggle to navigate these unspoken expectations. They might be labeled as disruptive or disrespectful simply for not knowing the social cues their privileged peers take for granted. The consequences of this mismatch between school culture and the realities of many students' lives are profound and far-reaching. The tragedy is that students who lack the dominant cultural capital are often misjudged. Their lack of familiarity with the school's unwritten rules can be misinterpreted as a lack of intelligence or potential. Teachers with the best of intentions may unknowingly have lower expectations for these children. This can create a self-fulfilling prophecy. Kids labeled as less capable begin to internalize that belief, damaging their self-esteem and leading to diminished motivation. This can have a cascading effect, hindering their academic performance and ultimately limiting their future opportunities. Furthermore, systems like ability grouping or tracking can solidify these advantages early on. Students deemed high potential based on factors often intertwined with cultural capital are placed in advanced classes. They get access to more challenging material, more experienced teachers, and a faster-paced learning environment that fosters deeper critical thinking and problem-solving skills. Meanwhile, students perceived as less academically inclined are placed on a slower track with a narrower curriculum. This not only widens the achievement gap, but also sends a clear message about their perceived potential, further limiting their chances of ever catching up. The impact extends beyond individual students. When schools primarily function to reproduce the existing class structure, we lose out on the incredible potential contributions of a vast segment of our population. Imagine the innovations, the scientific leaps, the artistic masterpieces we might miss out on because bright minds were misjudged and discouraged within a biased system. 
A truly just society should cultivate the talents of all its citizens, not just those fortunate enough to be born into privilege. And let's not forget the stark reality of unequal school funding. Wealthy districts, where parents possess abundant social and economic capital, can shower their schools with resources. This means smaller class sizes, state-of-the-art technology, a richer variety of electives and extracurricular programs, all of which contribute to a more stimulating and enriching learning environment. This further compounds the advantages that were already present, creating a cycle that's difficult to break for students from under-resourced communities. It's important to understand that Bourdieu's critique doesn't mean we should abandon hope for a more equitable education system. His work is a call to action, and in the next segment, we'll explore some of the ways educators and communities are fighting back to create schools that truly empower all children. Challenging the status quo within education is an ambitious but essential undertaking. Thankfully, there are innovative educators and programs paving the way towards a more just system. One critical strategy is known as culturally responsive pedagogy. This approach fundamentally shifts the way we teach. Instead of assuming a single correct cultural reference point, it acknowledges, respects, and builds upon the diverse backgrounds and experiences students bring to the classroom. Imagine a literature class where a teacher doesn't just assign Shakespeare, but weaves in analysis of rap lyrics or spoken word poetry. Students can engage in the same rigorous examination of themes, figurative language, and social critique all while feeling their own cultures and voices are valued within the academic space. Another way to foster cultural capital in students from all backgrounds is through targeted mentorship programs, connecting students with role models from similar communities who have achieved success can be incredibly powerful. These mentors offer guidance, expose students to opportunities they might not have known existed and instill a belief in their own potential. They also provide a crucial source of social capital, sharing the kind of networking connections that can open doors later in life. Some communities are embracing bolder changes by establishing schools based on entirely different models. These alternative learning environments might prioritize real-world problem solving, de-emphasize rigid standardized testing in favor of portfolios or project-based assessments, and encourage student voice in shaping the curriculum. These schools aim to level the playing field by allowing diverse forms of knowledge, intelligence, and creativity to shine through. While progress is being made, it's vital to recognize that transforming education cannot occur in isolation. Bourdieu's work reminds us that inequality is deeply ingrained in our society. To truly create schools where all children have a fair shot, we must also consider broader changes. Educational reform needs a strong foundation. Policies ensuring adequate and equitable funding for all schools, regardless of zip code, are essential. This means not just throwing money at the problem, but ensuring resources are directed towards proven strategies like smaller class sizes and well-funded teacher development, especially in schools serving underprivileged communities. Smaller class sizes allow teachers to give each student more personalized attention identify and address learning gaps early on, and create a more supportive learning environment. Well-funded teacher development programs equip educators with the skills and knowledge to implement culturally responsive pedagogy, effectively differentiate instruction to meet diverse learning styles, and navigate the complex social and emotional needs of their students. Dismantling rigid tracking systems within schools is also crucial. Too often, early ability grouping decisions can solidify self-fulfilling prophecies and permanently shut off doors for students who simply needed more time to develop their potential. Creating flexible and dynamic learning environments with opportunities for growth and remediation where needed can give students a better chance of fulfilling their individual trajectories. This might involve mixed ability classrooms with tiered assignments that cater to different learning paces or interdisciplinary projects that allow students to showcase their strengths in various areas. Furthermore, empowering communities most impacted by educational inequity is essential. When parents and local leaders have more power in shaping schools and designing culturally relevant curricula, they better meet the specific needs of their students. 
This kind of community-driven ownership can be a powerful catalyst for transformative change. Schools can partner with community organizations to offer wraparound services that address students' basic needs, such as health care and healthy meals. Parents can participate in school board meetings and advocate for policies that reflect their values and priorities. Of course, it's unrealistic to expect schools to single-handedly erase the broader patterns of social inequality. Policies that support working families, like affordable childcare, quality health care, and living wages, create the basic conditions for students to come to school healthy, ready to learn, and less burdened by the stress of economic insecurity. A society that truly values the potential of all its people must create a social safety net that ensures children aren't held back by circumstances beyond their control. Investing in early childhood education programs can significantly improve a child's cognitive development and language skills, setting them on a stronger foundation for success in school. Affordable housing initiatives can help families establish stability and reduce the stress of frequent moves which can disrupt a child's education. Policies that ensure access to quality health care can identify and address learning disabilities or health issues that might otherwise impede a child's progress. Borgio's theory of social reproduction challenges us to demand more from our schools. Education should be a powerful force for equity, a tool that unlocks the full potential within each and every child. It should not merely mirror society's inequalities, but actively combat them. Achieving this vision requires a multi-pronged approach. It means changing the way we teach, investing in the schools that need it most, and creating a society where all children have the basic resources and support to thrive. This is not merely an issue of fairness. It's about harnessing the brilliance that exists within all communities. Imagine the incredible contributions we stand to gain by nurturing and empowering a generation equipped to tackle the most pressing challenges of our time. Let's not accept a world where opportunity is determined by birth. Let's work tirelessly to dismantle the hidden barriers within our education systems and build a society where all children are given the tools they need to reach their stars. The future we create depends on it.